Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mia Mussolino with the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Um, like everyone else with these presentations, the hardest part was um, getting years, years of this stuff into uh, 15 minutes. So I'm, here goes. Uh, hold on. It's not working. There we go. Okay. So um, I won't spend too long with the background, but um, this is some facts about the Smithsonian. Um, the most important part of this slide is probably that we have um, about 6,800 employees and about that many uh, volunteers. Maybe I should move this down. Uh, and here are our Moodle sites. We have two Moodle uh, implementations. One is an external um, site for Moodle, and that's for training the volunteers and other affiliated staff that might not have a network account with us. And uh, the one on the bottom is um, the internal Moodle, which is our LMS and used to train employees. So background about the internal Moodle. Um, that, that Moodle uh, came about in about 2012. And um, the most important thing here is that about 75% of the courses in the internal LMS are really for classroom registration. We do have a good number of online courses there, but um, we have a customized version of the face-to-face plugin, and um, that helps us do about, let's see, about 15,000 annual classroom registrations. So that's the main focus of it, but we do have some online. Um, for that Moodle, I have trained about 35 e-learning Moodle teachers and about 75 face-to-face -face users. Um, for the external Moodle where we train our volunteers, um, that is a platform where we only do uh, online courses um, or blended learning courses to train the volunteers. Um, and since 2015, when we started um, the external Moodle implementation, I have trained about 30 Moodle teachers. So um, when I was looking for a graphic to use for my challenges slide, I thought, what better, to, uh, what better than um, Oscar the Grouch? Um, and that is a picture from the National Museum of American History. And um, so, Challenges usually make Oscar the Grouch grumpy, so <laughs> um, this is kind of how I base my presentation as far as uh, what are the challenges that I've come across in designing the program that I use to train the teachers um, and what have I done to, uh, to meet those challenges. So first, um, the diverse needs of the students um, who are the teachers um, that I need to teach. Um, some of them have uh, extensive training in education um, or instructional design, and then some are um, administrative professionals with no experience um, teaching, no experience with instructional design. So that is a big challenge. Um, <clears throat> there's also a wide range of experience. Um, I'm sorry, whoops. <laughs> the, the diverse, uh, sorry, I'm having trouble seeing. Um, some need only training in the face-to-face -face module. That's what I wanted to start with. Um, and some need training to teach a whole Moodle course. Um, so that is very um, challenging there. The timing, um, no one, this is, this is the biggest challenge I would say, um, no one needs to start at the same time. Um, everybody has a different uh, time frame of when they need to learn Moodle. Um, and uh, also hands-on training is needed. Um, that means they really need to get in and learn Moodle by themselves. They need kind of to be alone with it, is what, <laughs> what I tell people. Um, and um, it's difficult to do that if you're not going to do a classroom session and put them on a computer. Um, limited resources. I'm only one person and I'm only about half time on Moodle. Um, time constraints of students. I hear it all the time. If, um, if they can't get this done in you know, weeks or days, they're probably not going to, um, uh, they're not going to be successful. Um, they want to learn it fast and they want to um, put their knowledge to use right away. Um, diverse subject matter. Um, they need to use Moodle to train, to teach all kinds of subjects. There's such a huge range. 
Um, and this is a slide I uh, put together last year for the Miami conference, and I've updated it a little bit. But um, this is just a fraction of the subjects that people teach um, using Moodle at the Smithsonian through the internal and external uh, Moodle sites. So the course that I'm going to talk about um, <clears throat> is the course I use, and I've developed. It's in the it's in a um, second iteration, I would say, that I just put together this past summer. And um, I think I have uh, tackled all of the challenges that I showed on the couple previous slides ago. Um, there are five modules to the course. Um, the first is getting to know Moodle. Second is planning and designing your course. Third is building your course. Fourth, tracking student progress, and then next steps. Um, details about the course, each module has at least one lesson and a quiz. Some have videos, and you must get a grade of 70 on the quizzes in order to move forward. You can take the quizzes as many times as you want. Um, module three includes a practice course, um, <clears throat> and that is, I would say, the most important part of the course, and it is required to pass it, which I do review every course. Um, there are three optional polls and two optional forums, and the estimated time to complete is about eight to 10 hours. Um, I couldn't think of a way to present uh, what was in the course fully um, other than the course completion report. So that's where you can see what everybody has to do in order to get through the course. Um, everybody's familiar with the Moodle icons, so you can kind of see there's SCORM lessons, there's quizzes, um, there's a couple pages that have videos in them, um, and I do require the course um, evaluation in order to finish. This is an example of a lesson, an online lesson, which are pretty straightforward. Um, they're SCORM lessons. Some of them have videos with screencasts in them. Um, some of them are um, longer than others, but they take about 10 or 15 minutes to complete. And then the students will do a quiz afterwards to test their knowledge. So the first challenge that I'll talk about um, is a wide, very wide range of experience that I have in my students um, who are going to be Moodle teachers. Um, and for the more experienced students, for the ones that are ready to go and they, they have a big background in instructional design or education, um, I tell them, make sure you, make, you are really serious with your practice course and make your practice course your first course. Um, what that kind of encourages them to do is um, be very serious about it, and by the time they finish the course, they pretty much have their first course done, or at least um, put together you know, a draft of it. Uh, I also make some activities optional, um, and I give a lot of resources for more exploration, and that really makes them feel like they're kind of building their own course and charting their own way. Um, for the less experienced students, I provide op uh, opportunities for quick check-ins with polls, um, and uh, I encourage them to ask questions. And um, on the screen now is just showing um, one of the optional polls and optional forums. Also, with the um, to address the wide range of experience, um, <clears throat> I uh, instituted this in the new version to give myself alerts and notifications so that I can make sure each student is moving through. Um, because it's self-paced, I don't know what they're all doing, um, and I don't have time to check in on a regular basis. So if I know that there's four or five students in there and I haven't seen a notification from uh, that this or that student has um, passed a quiz or gotten through module three or whatever, I know that it's probably time to check in with them, make sure that there's nothing going on that is keeping them from doing the course, or maybe they're having trouble. Um, so that has been really helpful. OK, so timing. Um, this is the, I do have the uh, completion progress block. And this is showing five test students. They're not real students. Um, and this is kind of a typical view of what's going on in the course. Um, everybody's at a different point. Um, nobody is synchronized in any way. So that's hard for me. Um, but like I said, with the alerts and notifications, that really helps. Um, but um, the, the timing is that no, there's no specific start and end dates. So it's really difficult for me to keep that uh, straight. The completion progress block really helps me, though. 
Um, I do encourage the students to finish in 30 days because if they take too long, um, I really see the success level drop in students um, in, order, um, in terms of starting to use Moodle and um, being very successful right from the start. Um, so if they don't finish in 30 days and they don't have a really good reason, um, I often will unenroll them or tell them they need to start over or that kind of thing. Um, so for the hands-on training that's needed, I do have a practice course. Um, and the practice course, um, I estimate it takes uh, two or three hours. Um, they have a list of things they have to do in the course that I give them. The course is, it's got some blank, you know, it's got some starter activities and that kind of thing, but um, there's a whole list of things that they need to do, and there's a long document with very specific instructions. In my first iteration of the course, um, what would happen is people would go into the practice course and not come out, and <laughs> you don't want that. So um, they would get lost, not know what to do, so I've given them much more instruction. Also, I've given them a lot more, uh, I gave them a checklist of what to do in the course and a lot more um, rewards, kind of like um, how much more you have to go kind of thing at each step. So also for time constraints, it's really important in the course to um, give a badge for each m module to keep them going um, and moving and steadily completing the course. I give also a certificate for the end um, result and um, lots and lots of time um, estimates. Um, the last thing is that I have these community courses and they're not really courses because people get enrolled after they finish my online course, but what happens is um, they, uh, it's a community for them and I can give announcements, I can give um, tips for how to use Moodle, and I can really differentiate for each community of um, either the internal Moodle teachers or the external Moodle teachers. So it's very helpful to me. I don't have to spend a lot of time um, customizing a course, I can customize their community after they are done with the course. And here is um, an example of a how-to blog that I do for the external community, and I let people um, tell me what they want me to cover in that how-to blog, which I send out maybe every uh, couple of months with a new topic. So diverse subject matter, I don't really handle that in the course per se, but I do provide sharing opportunities with user group meetings. Um, I, I really try to do it once or twice a year. Um, I have course galleries in the community courses that show people um, what other teachers are doing that they might wanna do. And then before anyone even starts using Moodle, before anyone even takes my course, um, I meet with them and I try to discuss with them what they wanna do with Moodle, how they want to, um, what kind of activities they wanna use, and I usually show them a few examples of what other um, people, other teachers have done so they kind of have a direction to go. So just to end, um, the Smithsonian's mission is uh, um, an establishment for the increase in diffusion of knowledge. So um, I have always been an enthusiastic supporter of Moodle at the Smithsonian because I really feel that its strengths um, really support the Smithsonian's mission um, pretty well. Does anyone have any questions? Looks like there are some questions. Cool. So we've got a couple of hands raised here. Maybe we could go to this gentleman here who didn't get a chance to ask the question first last time. I'm very interested to hear about your um, implementation of using two different instances of Moodle, one internal facing and one external facing. Mm -hmm. Can you describe a little bit if there is any uh, communication or interplay between them? Is there content sharing? Is there reporting across the two instances? Thanks. Content sharing. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I take one course and I put it in another um, implementation. There's no content sharing per se, but I do have some of the teachers are, te I didn't even cover this, but some of the teachers actually are teachers in both. Um, so if they have a course, they, they might have the same course in both. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question. I, the, the way that they're implemented is internally we use LDAP for <laughs> logging in and externally um, they have to re register for an account. Yeah. Imagine a service which would allow you to share courses and resources. Such a thing might be MoodleNet. 
Um, okay, any more questions? I think there was one over here, this gentleman again. Okay, if you do have a question, then just raise your hand afterwards. When you get a new uh, teacher in your program, do they, how many, how long does it take them to get, I mean, are, when they go through, are they just teaching courses that have already been created? Or are they actually, when they go through a couple of courses, they're actually creating the course and teaching it? They create the course and they teach it. So how many courses does that take to before, so they're creating a course in, in the first course, when they enroll, they start creating their course, is that right? For the advanced students, yes. Um, okay. I have definitely seen the practice course that people do. It turns into their real course. Obviously, it's not good to go. They, you know, want to add to it or whatever. But, um, but it's, it's the basis for their first course. Okay. And then my last question is, what's the most difficult hurdle for them to get over uh, when they start making, you know, they start creating their own courses? Well... Getting, if they get, can get through the practice course, um, which really is, I think it's challenging. It has a lot of things that they're supposed to do. Um, if they can get through that, I really feel uh, that they can do the course on their own. So if I can get them through that in a timely way, um, they are successful. Or uh, what, what element in the practice course then do they, they usually find the most difficult? Uh, quizzes. I mean, it's not difficult, it's just time consuming because I have to make a quiz that has five to ten questions in it and with a variety of types and that kind of thing. Perfect, thank you. Great, and we've got one more question for you, Mayor, actually, over here. Okay. If you could just uh, run the mic, literally be a mic runner. <laughs> there we go. Um, first, we are super excited to talk to you later because we uh, do something similar, so let's chat later. But my question is, um, after people create courses, do, is there any sort of like review process that you go through to kind of like check to see that the courses are you know, high quality and like what you expect, or when they create it, that's just sort of what it is? Yeah, I didn't go into this part because I didn't have time, but um, I do have, I have a rubric that we use, and that is part of the, um, they actually, one of the steps of the practice course is running their course through the rubric on their own and figuring out how many points, there's, you know, it's silly, but there's a number of points for each, um, each category and whether, you know, I have to, I say in your practice course, tell me how many points you got in the rubric and where do, where do you need to improve it and that kind of thing. When they go out in the real world and they start their own courses, um, I tell them I have to review their first two courses um, and then they're kind of on their own. Okay, thank you very much, Mia.